objective is to share with you what I've learned about empathy and hope that you can adopt it in your life. So I want to start off with a story. And the story is about my friend who, he called me up and my friend was in love with this girl, right? And so I wasn't expecting him to say, dude, she doesn't want to see me anymore. And I, I, I didn't know how I would respond to this. Do I tell him, Dory man, you'll be okay? She wasn't worth your time anyways. Time will heal all wounds. And I thought, no, I, I can't say that. And I thought back to a time when, when I had experienced something similar myself years before, and I thought, how did that make me feel? And I felt alone at that time. And so I told him, man, don't worry. You've got your friends. We're here for you. Because my friend didn't need my sympathy. Sympathy says, that sucks. But empathy says, I understand. Sympathy says, I feel sorry for you. But empathy, empathy says, I know how you feel. And empathy is such an integral part of our lives. In fact, it's so necessary in all of interactions because it allows connection because we're able to share feelings amongst individuals. It's actually so integral to our being that it exists in our biology, in a network of neurons that we now know as mirror neurons. And as the name implies, mirror neurons allow us to mirror the thoughts and the feelings, the behaviors of the people around us. And I'm sure we've all seen this before. Like when somebody walks into a room and they're excited, you can't help but just get a little bit excited yourself. Or somebody's angry and they're frustrated at everything. It help, can't help but seep into us just a little bit. Or if somebody's tired and it's almost like it's contagious. Right? These mirror neurons were originally discovered by a man by the name of Dr. Rizzolatti out of the University of Parma in Italy. Now, as you can see, Dr. Rizzolatti is, in fact, the twin brother to none other than the Albert Einstein. <laughs> okay, that's not true. But what is true is that Dr. Rizzolatti and his researchers, they analyzed the brains of monkeys. And what they did was when these monkeys would reach out and pull a lever, they had neural activity going on in the frontal lobes by their motor neurons. But what was more interesting and discovered by accident was that when these monkeys on the sidelines were watching their counterparts pull these levers, they had a similar neural activity as though they were adopting the point of view of their monkey counterparts and in turn performing a virtual simulation in their own minds. These studies were later done in humans, famously with phantom limbs. And what was incredible about these studies was when people would watch someone's arm being poked or touched, they could understand the feeling. Of course, we couldn't feel it because we have touch and feel receptors that provide feedback to our brains. But what was even more interesting was that when these researchers would anesthetize the arms and essentially shut off these touch and feel receptors, people could physically feel the pain of being pinched by watching someone else's arm. As V.S. Ramachandran, a famous neuroscientist once quoted, it was as though the feelings, the barriers of feeling had been dissolved. We were able to experience someone else's feeling in our own minds, almost like a human Wi-Fi network. So why do we need to even study empathy? We understand, of course, empathy is very important. But why do we need to study? We're not empathy researchers. And I think to really understand this, we need to ask a question that's at the forefront of all of our minds. And that question is, how do we become successful? Because I'm willing to bet that everybody in this room wants to be successful. Why else would you come to a TEDx event? Why else would you be watching this from home? Everybody here wants to be all that they can with all that they are and strive to their highest potential. Well, how does empathy get us there? Well, for one, empathy drives connection. And connection is actually a part of the human condition. We can't live without it, or at least we can't thrive. And I'm not talking about this kind of connection, although she does look surprisingly happy. <laughs> I don't know why. But I'm talking about the connections that last the tests of time. But what, what constitutes a strong connection? I mean, if we were to put into words what we have with our best friends, and our closest family members, what would that sound like? Well, there's a lot of things that come to mind, but three that stick out to me are a sense of reliability and trust. You can count on them. You know they've got your back, and you know you've got theirs, no matter what happens. And two is a constant sense of connection. No matter how much time has passed, it can be years. You can get back together, and you can catch up as you haven't missed a beat in each other's lives. And lastly, and I think most importantly, total acceptance. They accept us for all that we are, all the greatness and strengths that we have, but also our weaknesses, our failures, and our shortcomings. 
And we'll come back to this. Okay, so we understand that relationships are an integral part to our life, but exactly how do they stand up? If we were to look at relationships, there's a lot of things that contribute to our well-being. And to answer this, we can look into one of the most comprehensive studies ever done in human history, the Harvard Men's Study, a study that followed the lives of 268 men as they entered college in the 1930s and led the rest of their lives. Some people are still being studied today. They're well into their 90s. $75 million spent, 20, or 75 years, $20 million spent, summarized in five words. Happiness is love, full stop. Now that's $4 million per word, which is a pay scale that I'd like to get in on. <laughs> so all, all this told us was that all you need is love? Isn't that a Beatles song? Maybe those Brits were onto something, but in all seriousness, George Valiant, who led the study for over 40 years, brought up this an amazing point, that if we're gonna invest in anything in our lives, we should be investing in creating and in strengthening and improving our relationships. Okay, so we know that relationships are really a, a secret to our happiness, but wait, how can, we, how can we be truly happy if we're not successful? I mean, how are we supposed to achieve this true happiness and isn't the common adage, I'm not going to be happy until I'm successful? I mean, I can ask every person in this room, who here has caught themselves saying, I'll be happy when I get into school. I'll be happy once I get that job, once I ace that exam. I'll be happy when I get the promotion, buy the house. And the list goes on and on. But the problem here is that as soon as we reach that goal, we move the goalpost. Every time we get there, we're already striving to the next. And because of this, as famous Sean Aker once said, we never allow ourselves to get there. We push happiness on the other side of the cognitive horizon. And I know I've been there before. I remember being 19 years old and having to return to high school because I literally did so bad the year before. Now, common sense should have told me working three jobs and going to school was a recipe for disaster, but like many of us, I thought I could do it all as long as I could grind through the work. But what ended up happening? I, I had to come back to high school and redo all of my classes. And my friends had all left for university and my relationships started to fall apart because I was in this time when I wasn't happy. And within the span of four months, my parents had separated, the girl that I was dating dumped me, and this dream of maybe one day becoming a professional athlete, well, that was gone. Safe to say, I wasn't this guy. No, I wasn't happy. In fact, I was disappointed in myself. I was angry, I had all these feelings going through me, and I was feeling a lot. And it got me thinking about this, this question, if, if, if being alive is about feeling, well, I am feeling right now, I'm not feeling happy, but what does happiness even do for me? I mean, is happiness just, just a distraction from what the real world looks like? What does happiness even give for me? And that ended up being one of the most important questions that I would ever ask in my life. And it led me down this path to find a, a field of research that would revolutionize the way that I thought about things. And that field of research was positive psychology. And positive psychology is very different from psychology. Psychology generally and historically asks the point, what is wrong with me? But positive psychology, they ask a very different question. They ask, what's right? They find the people that are above the curve in terms of their intellect, their creativity, their resiliency in the face of challenge, and they ask, why? Why is it these people can be faced against so much and still rise? And what they found was that when people are able to maintain a sense of optimism, or more specifically, adopt a mindset that is positive instead of negative, neutral, or stressed, they experience a series of cognitive advantages, highlighted extensively in Sean Aker's book, The Happiness Advantage. They experience higher levels of energy, less burnout. In fact, in specific studies, office workers, when given deliberate recognition and encouragement, saw 31% higher productivity levels in their workplace. Doctors were able to obtain diagnosis twice as fast, and their diagnoses were 19% more accurate. Even insurance agents were able to sell nearly 40% more when they adopted a mindset and were primed to be positive instead of negative, neutral, or stressed. And now, this all sounds great. All these people experiencing happiness also get the benefits of productivity, but you might be asking, what about me? What about us? Maybe it's been a hard week. Maybe it's been a hard month. Heck, maybe it's been a rough year. And I'm, we're doing the best that we can right now. 
Why aren't we be able to experiencing this amazing benefit? And with that, I empathize. Because right now, we're going through a more difficult time than we ever have in human history. In fact, right now, we have more decisions weighing over us than we have ever had before, from thousands of career paths to so many different things, pulling away our attention and giving us distraction. It really is no wonder that depression statistics have risen 10 times higher than they were in 1945. And on top of that, we're fed this reality that doesn't look like reality at all. In fact, our biggest media outlets are the world media and social media. The world media shows us that the world is filled with crime and corruption, trauma and terror. How are we supposed to obtain accurate judgment from that? And social media isn't a whole lot better either. I mean, social media is showing us the highlights of our friends' lives. They're going to Europe, they're going backpacking, snorkeling. It's really no wonder that some people think that the world is corrupt and that our friends are living better lives than us. The tables are not balanced and we need to balance them. How do we do that? Well, for one, maybe let's stop watching the news so much and focusing on it. Because a growing body of evidence shows that the news desensitizes us. And it causes us to focus on things that are outside of our control. But that's not enough. You can't just take away the negative. We need to be continuously seeking inspiration through whatever means that is. Whether it's reading the right books, listening to audiobooks, podcasts, TED Talks. But most importantly, spending time with the people that inspire us the most. Well, what about social media? We're seeing the highlights of each other's lives. Do we just start posting a bunch of depressing stuff and hope that it all evens out? No, that'll probably get us unfriended, which will probably make it even worse. But how about this concept? Sharing the things that we struggle with and thereby allowing people to share their own. And in doing so, we're able to create stronger friendships because the greatest of friendships are ones of total acceptance, where we're accepted for all the great things that we are, but also the things that we struggle with and the difficulties. And not to focus on them, but at least to acknowledge them. Because when we fail to acknowledge them, we start to experience what in psychology is known as the numbing effect. And the numbing effect essentially says that when we don't visit these more difficult parts of our lives, when we don't visit the guilt and shame and disappointment that haunts us, we're not able to experience the things on the other side of the emotional spectrum. We also dissolve the gratitude and the joy and the happiness, and we get stuck in this gray region where we're never feeling the highs of life, but we're also, we're also never having to swim in the deep waters. Could it all be so simple? Could it all start from empathy? We know that empathy builds our relationships, and we know that our relationships are one of the biggest contributions to our health and our happiness, and ultimately, we work better when we're happy. I wanted to put this to the test. And so, through a series of serendipitous events, I joined a nonprofit called Live Different. And together we created two teams that would travel all across Canada. We'd have 50,000 students that we'd be presenting in front of, and our team got to travel from Ontario to the West Coast and back. It was a, a band as well as three speakers. We logged 10,000 miles on a big old black school bus our band Autumn Kings, and the three speakers. And what did we talk about? Well, we got to talk about some of the things that we struggled with growing up. One girl sharing her story of drug addiction, and another girl a story about a learning disability. And me? I got to talk about what it was like to move around schools as a young kid. I went to four schools in four years, and the difficulties that ensued because of that. And each year, it got just a little bit harder. And I found myself crawling a little bit deeper into the shell. And then I get to high school, I'm in a new board, and I don't know anybody, I started to develop this really bad acne. And it was so difficult for me to interact with people. And I remember one person's comment on it just confirmed everything that I had thinking in my own mind. And I found myself dropping into this deep hole. And I got to a point where I couldn't even, I couldn't even turn on a light when I, when I went into a bathroom. I couldn't even look at myself. But I also got to talk about the other stuff. I got to talk about how one person's kind comment at a particularly vulnerable point in my life would turn my life around. And I would sit there and I'd just feel like, Miles, you can do this. And shortly after, I learned to love school. And I also got to tell them about this dream about being able to pursue trying to become a professional motocross racer. And although that didn't happen, after I left university, I got to work for one of the biggest rally car race teams in the world and moved to the United States to work for two years. Now, I didn't know how these students were going to react to our stories. 
I mean, it could be anything. Some kids came up and told us that they loved the band and they loved the funny videos, but some kids really opened up to us. Some kids shared messages about having gone through disease themselves or living in orphanages, having lost parents or going through difficult relationships. Some kids were so happy that they even gave us our Pokemon, they gave us their Pokemon cards. That'd be like my dad giving me his truck. Some of them were even holographic. And we didn't know how to respond. I mean, we're not counselors. We didn't know what to say to them. But the reality is that it didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. And what mattered was that they got to say it. And sometimes for the first time, that environment was open to them. And we could see in front of our eyes the sense of release come over them as these were some things that they'd been haunting them for all of their lives. If you're going to take away anything from this conversation, understand that empathy is a practice. And like any practice, any skill, it can be improved upon over time as long as we practice. And I really love how Teresa Wiseman broke down empathy. She breaks it down into four simple steps. The first step being perspective taking. Trying to understand from another person's point of view, looking through their lens. Also, it's the practice of non-judgment. Because empathy doesn't happen when we're judging others. It only happens outside of judgment. Thirdly, it's understanding the feelings of another person. And when we do this, it really causes us to reflect on our own and to understand our own emotions. And finally, to reflect that understanding and to show the people that we truly care. And when when we take these in our tool belt and we interact, we're able to strengthen the bonds with the people that are closest to us. We're able to lead lives that are happier and healthier. And most importantly, we're able to seek the things that matter the most to us. And that, in my opinion, is an idea worth spreading. Thank you very much.